Welcome back, folks. I'm Jake Ellenbogen. and he is Gary Sheffield Jr. This is Yankees Unloaded, and it is following a win because yesterday, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, Gary. I woke up and I wasn't I wasn't feeling as well uh, because of the yesterday. That yesterday loss bothered the shit out of me. Um, just because I thought, you know, reflecting on it, I mean, I think we absolutely had the right takeaway analysis, all of that with Nestor, but I felt even like better about Nestor's performance when I slept on it. And then like, again, to like wake up and be like, wow, you really lost that game after the manager took out the guy that was unhittable and Alec Marsh. And it, I don't know. It just normally baseball games don't bother me. Remember that one game that like really bothered me. They blew against the guardians. This was oh, kind of yeah, like bad. that. Yep. This mm-hmm. is kind of like that. So obviously 24 hour rules in full effect. We're no longer talking about that. Uh, The Yankees beat the Red Sox eight to one, a team that used to be their arch rival. Uh, Now I would say not trying to, you know, discredit the history between these two teams, but right now they're just not on the same platform. Um, The Red Sox are 35 and 34. So, you know, good for them. They're above 500. But I mean, the Yankees, you know, they, they've they now won their 50th ball game. So actually, they're 35 and 35 after this, uh, the Red Sox are. So, yeah, I guess to give Boston some credit, which uh, you are. Yeah. Since 04, they're a better baseball team than us. That's just yeah. the fact they've of the They've had more matter. success. More team success in terms of postseason. Just hasn't which, lined way, up. Yeah, because I know Yankees fans in general, they would point to win-loss records, and we're going to pass Boston in that department every pretty much every year. But yeah, we kind of judge ourselves and our own teams based on what we do in October, based on what we do against Houston at the end of the year, based on what we do against Boston or any of these teams, the LA Dodgers, right? Some of these teams that we're planning on seeing Baltimore. Yeah. Like if we don't do anything against them, then we're not considered a success. And Boston's had a ton of that. So it just, it's weird because the Yankees and Red Sox just can never be good at the same time. I don't no. know what happened there. The curse um, of the Bambino. It just yeah. Apparently, it's, like it's my a new dad. And, yeah, my dad and A Rod got the memo. Jeter and all those guys. They're like, okay, Boston's got David Ortiz and Manny, and we're gonna get our shit together. Which I mean, at that time, the Yankees were always good, right? So yeah. that was just a really good time in this rivalry, and it's weird to see a non-competitive game at Fenway Park. Um, and for Boston fans who are here watching this and are like, what the hell is this podcast? I mean, this is probably watching our show and breaking down this game is probably a lot better than what's happening with the Celtics tonight. I know for those of you who saw what happened with the Boston Celtics and the Dallas Mavericks, I mean, it was just a beatdown. They lost by like 50. The Red Sox got pummeled by the Yankees. Verdugo, who was just traded, by the way, the Red Sox were like, this is a low effort. I know during the game, Yes Network, they kind of brought it up. They're like, yeah, Verdugo and Cora don't really hate each other anymore. They're, they've kind of agreed to disagree. And that's all great. But it looks really bad when that player you just got rid of that you said was low energy shows up and drives in four and was the star of the night. And so. he has uh, all we know him for is energy. By the way, I thought it was funny so that far. they had Verdugo play right field and Soto play in left. Yeah, which was absolutely about the defensive assignment. So it just goes to show they think very highly of Alex Verdugo defensively, and he's been amazing. So, yeah, I I, uh, I get what you're like saying because like, hey, it shows that they like Soto him. can play left field. Well, so it shows that they both are flexible. Yeah, um, and Verdugo might have more than just a, a rental spot here in New York. Um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We we kind of we talked about that off air. We'll get to that. Um, not trying to flip flop here. I always felt like I would want Verdugo back. It's just a matter of will it happen. And you know, I've seen comments, you know, under our, our videos say like, look, you guys don't have Torres coming back. You don't have Rizzo coming back. You don't have Lemayhu coming back. Why isn't there money there for Verdugo? And I think it's an absolutely fantastic point. Why isn't there money there for Dugo? Because there is. I mean, Verdugo, if he is back, he is going to get Torres' money because I don't think Torres is back. So instead of talking about that right now, talking about the game, Verdugo 
you know, goes three for five, four RBIs, a home run, had more. I think he did more in this game than I think I saw Katie Sharp post that he's ever done at Fenway in the postseason, which is just wild. Uh, that's a lot of postseason games. So that's something. But you could just tell, it, it, you know, the whole, you know, Michael Jordan meme, you know, took it personally. He took this freaking thing personally. And you know what? Good for him. Uh, he gets to go to his former employer and he gets to basically say, you know what? You traded me to your arch rival. You do not do that. Okay. If you don't believe in the the guy's ability. Okay. If, if you really feel like the guy is just washed, if he's done, he's chalked, we can use every single, you know, explanation in the dictionary. That is the most disrespectful thing for a Red Sox to be traded to the Yankees. Okay. That means the Red Sox are like, we don't have any value for you. Yeah. We, you're slot, we, man. You're, you're nothing. And he took that and he's like, you know what? They think I'm dead in the water. They think I'm, I'm six feet under. Well, I'll show them. And he's done that this year. Michael K brought up multiple times. There's no way the Red Sox thought he would have this type of season because they would not have gotten rid of him if they believed he'd have this type of season. But I'm happy for him. He's gotten a lot of shit. Um, I think he is exactly what the Yankees need, that energy, that fire. And also, the dude is just a great guy for the clubhouse. I mean, he his is. energy has been so infectious. We talk about Juan Soto all the time. But all their celebrations were from Verdugo. Like Verdugo yeah, has fun. basically created a culture with Juan Soto. And they're like this, you know, party school, essentially. But, you know, when it comes to taking care of business and, you know, David Cohn mentioned this on the broadcast, they're just, you know, they're dancing, they're having a good time, but they, they win games. They don't just put on costumes and, and put on crowns and stuff after each home run. They take care of business and they did so today with their 50th one of the year. Yeah, that's the most important thing, taking care of business. And when the Yankees are taking care of business, they can go dance around and have fun. But absolutely. I thought the broadcast actually brought up a pretty good point. And we'll they dive deeper do. into the point. <laughs> they bring up a lot of good points, but I want to yeah. go further with it. Yes. They mentioned that we don't have a bunch of props, right? And of course, we're bringing up Toronto and their ridiculous celebration. I mean, at one point this season, we were beating the Toronto Blue Jays by like eight and they were putting jackets on because they hit a home run coming into the dugout. It looks I absolutely stupid, completely ridiculous. Now they're not going to take direct shots. Now I'm a podcaster. I'll say whatever I want. So that looks ridiculous. We but knew the who Yankees they were talking about. Feel. <laughs> yeah. The Yankees have some feel. And I will say this about the Yankees culture in general over the years. We're known, known as more uptight. We're, Everyone needs a shave. Uh, no ridiculous walk-up songs, right? Uh, when my no dad numbers, was there. No names yeah. in the back. When my dad was there, they would tell the players, hey, if we lose this game, now this sounds crazy, but if we lose this game, you can't leave the dugout. Stay in the dugout for at least five minutes. It's a ridiculous thing to tell players, but it's an uptight type of mentality in there so some of it's working of course because obviously the yankees have done their fair share of winning the last 35 years but at the same time it's not exactly as much fun winning's fun but the other stuff like there's so much that happens from opening day all the way to the last pitch of the season you gotta have some fun and this yankees team's fun doogie's Absolutely. fun soto's fun aaron judge is kind of fun i think he's just a really good player but he's not that fun of a player um, he's not the type of guy who's going to bat flip. And what we saw with Doogie today where he hit a home run and he's like, yeah, this is, this is my shit is essentially what he said. Cause if, if anyone needed to know what he said out there, he came around third base and said, yeah, this is, this is my place. This is my shit. Okay. And by the way, I don't know if you saw what Will Middlebrook said. I thought it was funny. <laughs> did you see what he said? I did not. I saw Papelbon saying he needs okay. to get hit. That's exactly what Will Middlebrook said, and I think you're higher than hell with that. Are you kidding? <laughs> let me let me say we're this. We're going Jake. out there and saying guys should get beaned. Jake, let me say this. As a visiting player, remember, you were traded away from an organization because that organization said 
we don't think you're going to do anything for us. We think these other guys are better. Okay. They get rid of you. You show up to Fenway. You haven't spoken to anyone since. You haven't been in the headlines at all. Okay. He's Alex Verdugo, just a really good player in this league. He's not a superstar. So nothing's happened. He shows up to Fenway Park and completely out of his control, he's booed. Okay. It was clear as day on the broadcast. He was booed. He hits a home run. Emotions are flying on both sides. Red Sox fans feel like they're pissed off. He's now a Yankee, which he didn't control. He didn't choose to go to the Yankees. He's just here doing a job. He gets he hits a bomb dead central 420 feet. You think he's just going to run around the bases? Are you smoking something? Oh, I know. That was Give such a an FU home run, too. And Luis Heels throwing 100 miles an hour. You're going to hit one of our players, and then what? Then what? You're oh, going to do something about it? Okay, well, here's 102 at the back of your neck. And yeah. that's a game that the Red Sox wouldn't want to play because you have to remember, when you hit somebody, if Verdugo got hit, okay, just saying, if he got drilled, first of all, with a 95 on our fastball, I promise you, I promise you guys, 100 is going to hurt a lot worse. And it was coming. I'm telling you guys right now. A lot worse. If you hit Doogie, we're getting our retaliation. I promise you. And it's not, we're not going to hit the next guy. I promise you we're not no, hitting Tyler O'Neill, who no, struck out no, four no, times no. tonight. No, we I already know where you're Devers. going with that. You're, we are hitting you're Devers. You're going to hit Devers every time. That's absolutely right. Yep. And I don't want that game, No, to be clear. But if you start something, you know, it's going to be something. And that's something on this podcast. We're going to be honest. And I'm I'm a friend of Will Middlebrooks. I, I absolutely think he has a ton of great baseball knowledge. He does a great job with Nesson. But I will say this. Really smart people come up with some bad takes, and that's what I've done is addressed it. Yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, I told you the other day, um, I'm not like, I don't know Will Middlebrooks. I mean, I remember when he played, of course. I don't know him mm -hmm. personally like you do, but... Um, I told you the other day, I was like, Jonathan Papelbon followed me on Twitter. Like, and I don't feel yeah. like I'm absolutely like, here's the thing. I might be a little big in the football world. Like I'll have like really big followers in football and I'll be like, okay, that makes sense. Like I'm new to this whole baseball, you know, content creation thing. So when I have like Papelbon following me, I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know, but uh, that's why I saw it. But no, um, today, you know, started off a little like, you know, heal. What are we going to get out of him? This is a fine start. Okay. Uh, obviously, you know, it's not a start from an ace. Uh, it's not Luis Heel's best start or even, you know, the eighth best start that he's had in the last 12 games. But, you know, the reality is um, Luis Heel going on the road, pitching a four hitter, you know, striking out six, uh, fighting through. Um, this was, this was a big deal for me. And I think this was a turning point for his development because you already know where I'm going with this. Aaron Boone, I tweeted about this, actually got some decent uh, you Let's know, go. pushback there. Or not pushback, but support. Aaron Boone prioritized feel over analytics. He's been doing it consistently. I feel like we're the only one calling it out. And it, we're going to call it out again because Aaron freaking Boone, man. You know, I'd give him the game ball today. Because that was that was pivotal. If he took out heel, we don't know what would have happened. Okay, and I like that he he let him finish it out. That was so that went against everything analytical because heel is a right hander. You had two lefty batters in a row. He has the perfect guy, Victor Gonzalez, sitting there in the bullpen, and we like Victor Gonzalez. I like Victor Gonzalez. The reality is this means more than just this game. Luis Heal, this is a huge moment in his development. He felt for the first time probably all year that he's like, wow, I'm getting the trust from my manager. It was obvious. He was he'll not it. expecting it. No, he, he not expecting around. it. You could tell on that last changeup, okay? Yes. This is the second to last hitter he had. When he walked the guy, he said, oh, he drops his shoulders. Just looks right, right over at him. He throws the rosin bag. Okay, when that happens, he knew he was out. Okay, it was a done deal. And at that point, we were talking about polling him a batter prior. Okay, on the sh on the broadcast, they were talking about polling him. And yeah. it made total sense. He didn't have his stuff. He had four walks today. 
He didn't know at all. Like you started seeing a little bit more slider. He was going to his slider, which we don't see happen. He does no. not throw that pitch. He throws it statistically 7% of the time. We were seeing sliders. So it kind of goes to show you that Heel was feeling his way through this start. He did not have the touch on his fastball. It was apparent from pitch one. Forcing fastballs up. If he's off, that fastball is overthrown and above the strike zone. Over and over and over again. It's obviously frustrating to watch, but when you look at his numbers overall, yeah, he, his ERA is hovering around two. So he obviously makes his fair share of adjustments. But again, Boone was incredible. This was the best game I've ever seen him manage. And I mean that because I've watched hundreds of games managed by Boone. And he's told us, I don't lean on analytics. He said this for years. And what he's chosen to do over the years did not back that up at all. It seemed like analytics were just dictating every direction that he went, every direction this team went, and whether it was our general manager, our manager in the dugout, and it seemed like even if Boone was thrown out of the game, the guys behind him were like in suits and tie, just making <laughs> nerd decisions that had nothing to do with feel of baseball. This game today was 100% feel. Not one analytic ever would have told you to leave heel in this game. And Absolutely I tweeted, not. and so did you, that getting him through the fifth inning will impact this series. Because when you're talking about a series with the Boston Red Sox who are right at 500, this is as mid of an organization in 2024 as it gets. They will show up, beat some good teams on a night, lose to some bad teams on a night. You don't not really sure who they are, but when you do things correctly with proper feel, you can go out and sweep teams like this on the Absolutely. road. So it's Absolutely. just fantastic from Boone. Fantastic. No, I loved it. Um then I thought he did it again with Canley, okay? Canley walks the first two batters. You and I are texting each other like, yeah, I don't like that. Uh, you yeah. know, and and look, there might be something to monitor with Canley here. He, you know, they brought it up in the broadcast. His average is down by, you know, three miles per hour, or maybe even four. I think it was Yeah, three. it's not good. It's not good. Um, this is somebody that was a hard thrower, you know, throwing around 97, 98, consistently averaging that. And now his night, you know, tonight he averages around 93. It's a little scary, but Canely, and it's kind of funny because the two really coincide with each other. Heel didn't have his fastball, so he went, you know, with the slider, like you mentioned, and that changeup, which you laughed on Twitter. You were like, 96 mile an hour changeup? What are we doing here? It's um, not a changeup. I don't know what the hell that pitch is. They keep calling it a changeup. <laughs> Maybe that's his grip. That's not what's coming out. No. 96, I don't care what. I don't care what anyone says. That is not registering to me as a changeup. I don't care. It's, it's just Stupid. funny. But the point I'm making here is that he'll... And when we say he didn't have his fastball, because I know there are some people out there that don't really understand what we're talking about. Well, you know, Jake and Gary, he threw 101 miles an hour. That's great. But he was looking like the beginning of the season Rodon where he kept missing up. And when you don't have command of your fastball... You ever wonder why it seems like pitch counts are flying up? It's when guys are throwing a lot of fastballs and they're missing. They're not locating properly. And that was what was happening with heel. So he really had to rely on his changeup and his slider. The same can be said with Canely, although he only has two pitches. His fastball was not even fast enough. See, that's the thing. Heel's missing location-wise. He's still throwing 101. But you have Canely, who's throwing 92. He's missing the location. And then he's like, all right, well, all I have is a changeup. And luckily for him, his changeup is absolutely disgusting, repulsive, all the the synonyms for that. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, it's gross. It's absolutely gross. And that's how that important is it why, is for him to start throwing 97 again. Exactly. And that's why, you know, we're hoping, because right now it doesn't look great. He did come back from injury recently. So we're hoping that a start like this or, you know, a, a, a appearance like this. Yeah. He walked two guys. He struck out the next two that's on Boone because Boone kept him in there and got him out of that jam. The, the inning still went on because you can't keep him in for that third batter. No. Then you bring in Ferguson and Ferguson four straight strikeouts was just lights out. Um, this, and I'm not saying this is who he is and this is who he'll be. 
But, you know, you had mentioned, I think, last 11, 12 innings, he's been dominant. Um, Ferguson was was traded for, with Gonzalez, by the way, um, you know, from the Dodgers. The, the Yankees gave up one of their top prospects in Trey Sweeney, uh, who had kind of fallen out of favor, you know, with the pecking order, with all these, you know, guys in the farm system. They got those two, okay? We talked about Gonzo. He's good. 2.75 ERA. He's, you know, he's good. We like him. Ferguson started off good, very quickly took a nosedive. Now it looks like he's coming back up. Is he a stock that's about to go hyperbolic? I don't know. But what I will tell you is that the Ferguson tonight is exactly the guy that the Yankees were trading for. Because Gary, I'll tell you right now, they like Victor Gonzalez. That trade wasn't for Victor Gonzalez. That trade was for Caleb Ferguson. They loved Everything that he had, they loved his stuff and they loved his overall potential to potentially be a setup or even a closer. And we saw a glimpse of why they traded for him tonight. Okay, I'm going to pump the brakes just a second. I agree with what the Yankees saw. Totally. This is absolutely what the Yankees saw. They saw somewhat of potential because Ferguson did pitch well in LA. Okay, this Mm. is not like his first rodeo. Okay, so Matt Blake and and Cashman and the whole staff said, I think we can really work with this guy. But just numbers-wise, okay, Caleb Ferguson, and I have him right in front of me, his last 11 games, he's thrown eight and a third, seven hits, one run, three walks, and 12 Ks. 12 Ks in your last eight and a third is spectacular. Now, of course, those numbers are a bit skewed because, of course, the Yankees are going to put him in against left-handed hitters. And opportunistic situations now that's fair but you still have to strike guys out and usually when he's coming into these games it's the seventh through the ninth inning right these are high leverage situations and pitching in new york is high stress everyone should be able to recognize that so these numbers shouldn't be taken lightly he's been really good now i for on the other hand haven't loved what i saw out of caleb ferguson especially at the beginning of this year i didn't like it at all and i still feel that the Yankees need reinforcement in their bullpen. I absolutely believe someone else has to get in there because unless Tommy Canley's velocity spikes back up and you expect major output from him, well, you know, that leaves us in a situation where you're getting output from guys like Michael Tonkin, right? Victor Gonzalez, and you're going to trust those guys in October. For me, on the other hand, I feel like, Jake, these guys are good enough to get an output in the regular season, but some of these guys don't necessarily have the pedigree and I don't have the expectation of them to be great down the stretch. So I think the Yankees are still maybe an arm or two short in the bullpen, but of course I love what's happening with this pen right now because we're finding some diamonds in the rough. I mean, we just are. Well, I agree with you. I, it doesn't feel like this is, and, and I mean, I'm not trying to be a, a, you know, a guy that's flip-flopping. I was just saying, you know, Ferguson has been really good as of late, as you've brought up, but he has been, yeah. You know, I, I still haven't changed my opinion on him. Um, he has not had a good year. I, he might be like, like I said, if he, if he's the, the stock that's going hyperbolic and he's about to be great the rest of the year, we'll sign up for that in a heartbeat. And that changes the game. But keep in mind even if he does that, right? Even if he is fantastic, Ian Hamilton has started to tail off a little bit, right? He has. Yep. And so then you have, you know, Tommy Canely, who's a little bit of a question mark there because we just talked about, I mean, his changeup might be the best pitch of any pitcher in the bullpen. I mean, really, uh, it, it's filthy. But at the same time, you know, he has over a five year array and he, his fastball is still a concern. If he doesn't get that velocity, He's just going to be a one pitch pitcher if we're being honest. So that's scary. Then, you know, you have Victor Gonzalez who it seems like they've kind of turned him into just a specialist now. I don't really know why, but it seems like that's what he is. Um, I don't love that because I think he is shown he can pitch, you know, an eighth inning or seventh inning if need be. Um, But they like him. He was not happy coming out of today's game, by the way. He was he's, pissed. He's, he always looks pissed because he's, he's literally become the, the specialist, the guy that comes in, deals with the lefty and they're like, all right, we're good. And he's like, you know, Ron Marinaccio love the guy, but it's like Clay Holmes is having a really good year. Going to try and not hold yesterday too much against him over the course of an entire season. Um, lately, it has seemed like he is more, 
he, he's not as dominant. Um, so hopefully he gets back on, on that path, but you know, I'm not pa- pushing the panic button on him, but I mean, keep in mind, they lost Loisaga. Okay. They lost Loisaga and Nick birdie who you and I have not really been overly high on. They were very high on. Okay. They, they were. were, they were very, very high on him. They thought he was going to be the new setup, man. It's why Marinaccio didn't make the team. Nick birdie beat out Marinaccio. That's what happened. Now Marinaccio's back. Okay. Dennis Santana is over in Pittsburgh, so he's gone, right? You have guys in the minors. I look at Uendris Gomez, who they probably want him to be, you know, a starter in the minors, but he's a bullpen guy in the majors. I think he could help. Cody Poteet needs to stay on this roster once he... I don't care when Cole's back. Poteet needs to stay. Um, and if Teams around the league are probably like, you got to be shitting me. This guy... Because Poteet's not coming out in opening games. I think that was the expectation. Yeah. Poteet's going to go out there, give us four. He's going to throw, right? He's going to throw 60 two pitches. Hits. Right. The dude goes out there, and he's actually pitching. He, the Yankees are giving him an opportunity to actually start games and yeah. make a real start, go out there Absolutely. and throw 80 pitches. And he has shown, A, that he can throw strikes. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Nothing's worse than bringing someone from the system. They show you a bunch of stuff and a bunch of projections guys tell you how good they are and they can't throw a damn strike well oh, i know so teed hasn't had that problem okay so that's been amazing for the yankees but as far as their bullpen some of these guys who are giving us output that's all great there are going to be guys who are helpful in the regular season that you don't necessarily trust in the postseason and also when it comes to high leverage situations the more quality arms we have in the bullpen the more we can protect the most important guy in there okay which is clay holmes Clay Holmes is a guy who's looked dominant when he's fresh. When he's not fresh, his sinker starts to flatten out. You start seeing more contact, and it exposes some of our infield defense. Our infield defense has gotten a lot better as the season's gone on, so I'm really happy about that. But there have been a couple holes, right? Rizzo in Clay Holmes' last blown save, Rizzo completely botched a play. Okay, so that also had a huge thing to do with why that game was blown in the first place. But having said that, the Yankees might need one more arm that you can say, okay, I don't just see projection here. I have pedigree. I have something I can rely on. And it also can help protect Clay Holmes because the Yankees mission number one out of that bullpen and their whole staff should be getting Garrett Cole healthy and maintaining the health of Clay Holmes and making sure he's not overworked. Boone talked about it earlier this year. He does not want him pitching 85 times this year, 80 times. And I get that, right? He doesn't want him to throw 100 innings. That's fair. But in order to do that, you also have to have the personnel to make it work. You can't just not throw him. So that's all I got to say about it. No, I, I hear you there. I mean, I think right now, you know, the Yankees, they have reinforcements coming. The way I look at it is they're going to be in the way. Nick Birdie is not going to have a star, uh, spot. You, they're going to have to shove a guy out who probably shouldn't be shoved out for him. Uh, Scott F. Ross is not going to have a spot. He's probably going to have to shove a guy out that shouldn't be shoved out. And Lou Trevino should be DFA the moment he comes back from 60. Cause like, come on now. He, I do not want Lou Trevino in this bullpen, but I will say we didn't talk about Luke Weaver or Michael Tonkin who definitely deserved to be talked about going into uh, the postseason. Then we'll get to Trevino's home run, how well he's hitting and then talk about Verdugo and we'll wrap up the show. Um, looking at the bullpen, just, you know, Gary, I mean, kind of off the top of your head, how many bullpen pitchers do you expect to have on an October roster? Like day one playoff game, you think it's six, you think it's seven. I mean, it's weird because I know the Yankees are going to want to have like Jemai Jones on their roster potentially for like that speed, have like one of those utility guys. People will scoff like how does Jemai Jones make a postseason roster? Look at the speed. You know, a pinch runner. We talk about how runs are a premium. A guy like that could actually get on the roster. But, you know, they're going to have to be creative here because, I mean, Gary, we talk about it. Jason Dominguez, you know, we, t- we talk about guys like that. And it's like, you know, who? Well, how many bullpen guys are you going to have versus how many guys are you going to keep on the bench? Because, I mean, say you get 25, right? And we'll just say, doing the math real quick, you got five in rotation, Poteet, 
and add Nestor on top. So you got seven starting caliber pitchers, right? So you got seven starting pitchers. That's seven. You have nine guys in the lineup. Then you have your bench. So if you're doing that, you're at 16. I think it's it's 26, not 25, right? Yes. Okay, so it's 26. So you got 16 that I've already mentioned there. Then let's just say the the bench is one of uh, Rizzo or LeMahieu. So that's one of them, 17. Um, assuming there's no trades, whatever, just the way it is right now, 17. Then you have Jemai Jones, 18. Jason Dominguez, 19. And then do you keep another guy in the bench? Well, you'd have to. You have to keep a backup catcher. So let's just say Austin Wells, that's 20. That puts you at six bullpen guys, Gary. So it, it really makes me wonder, are they just going to roll with their seven starting pitchers, put two of them in the bullpen, maybe even three of them in the bullpen, run four-man rotation? And then at that point, you know, the rest are, are bullpen pitchers. Are you dealing with six guys? Like, wh- what do you think about that? Well, for one, of course, they trust Garrett Cole. I mean, you just got to look at the names, right? And who oh, the course. Yankees should trust in October. And in my opinion... It's the list isn't as long as what people want to give it credit for, which is not a huge problem because there aren't more than three or four guys. These other teams trust either. You think Baltimore is comfortable in an October game with their five starter? They're not right. The yeah. only team in baseball who's like, oh, yeah, I'm cool with my five starters. Probably like Seattle. That's about it. But Garrett Cole. OK, I'm just going down the depth chart. Then yeah. after that is Nestor Cortez. Do I want Nestor Cortez who threw very well? Okay, he threw very well in his last start. Overall, he's been much better than the expectation. But do I want a guy who I would consider the sixth best pitcher in our rotation starting a game in October? No. So I'd say, okay, Nestor Cortez is going to the bullpen. Still trust him, just not at that level, right? So no. Carlos Rodon, of course we paid him to be a postseason starter. He's in the rotation. Marcus Stroman I do trust. In a postseason game, I actually trust him to start a game. I don't shorten the rotation to push him out and use him as a right-handed arm, kind of the way that Washington did with Patrick Corbin. I don't do that. Not with him. Clark Schmidt has the stuff. Didn't last year or the year prior where he was throwing 92-93, but these last, like, I'd say 15 months, Clark Schmidt has real one through three in the rotation stuff. He's throwing 97-98. Very different pitcher. I trust him in a postseason setting. Luis Heal, of course I trust him. So what is that, four or five guys right there? That's five guys. So I personally don't go to a four-man rotation. I just don't think that's smart. You're talking either. about Garrett Cole, who's off an injury. He's, of course, going to be built up by October. I don't play around with a four-man rotation. I just go five, and you kick the odd man out. And however many surplus starting pitchers you trust, you throw them in the bullpen. If you don't trust them at all to pitch, get them off the roster. Yeah. I mean, I think you go with a five man rotation. Cause to your point, like Seattle, like if you have that luxury, use it. <laughs> I mean, that, that puts you at an advantage other teams. And we've seen the Yankees even in the past, like they had to start CC Sabathia one game on three days rest. And it's like, we don't trust anybody else for this game. This is it. This is the, the elimination game. So, yeah, I mean, I'm with you on that. I think Poteet and uh, Cortez would go to the, to the bullpen, in my opinion. I don't know how they're going to, you know, Schmidt could lose his spot because of the injury. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I think it almost kind of, you can cheat a little bit because now those two are in the bullpen. And based on what I just said, and that's just kind of a guesstimate, you'd have six guys. So, Gary, to, to wrap up this segment of this show, you know, Clay Holmes, that'd be one of them, right? Um, does Canely make the postseason roster? To me, that's a giant question mark. I have no idea. Is Ian Hamilton on that roster? I don't know. I, I don't think I, that's opinion-based. Tommy Canley is all velocity. I can look up at the radar gun and tell you if you should make the postseason because I'll tell you right now, if Tommy Canley's throwing 92, he'll tell you this, okay? He'll tell you, Boone will tell you, if he's throwing 92 miles an hour in late September, he's not on the postseason roster because that tells Absolutely me he's going to be getting hit. Okay, that he oh, will yeah. be getting hit at that point. That's that's all stuff related, not location or anything like that. It's not personal. If you don't have the stuff that you need to get outs, well, I can't put you on the roster. I cannot trust you when everyone's butt cheeks are all tightly clenched and everyone's worried about 
how we're getting outs. You don't want to throw a guy who can't get his velocity going. That just doesn't make sense, right? And Tommy Canley knows this. So if his stuff rebounds, well, there goes a postseason spot right there. He's on the team. He's a very good pitcher in this league. He's pitched in New York. We know he can do it in October. So it's all health related. So hopefully he's healthy and it kind of answers that question for us because I want him on the team. Yeah, I want him too. Obviously, like I've mentioned, he's a local guy in my area. So, you know, I root for him for that reason as well. But um, Hamilton, I think, is going to figure it out. I, I do think he's going through just, you know, a little bit of a spat. But Agreed. still, though, you know, there, it, he is a question mark. I mean, right now, if you had to guarantee guys would be on the postseason roster in that bullpen, it's Holmes, it's Weaver, and it's Tonkin and maybe Marinaccia. That's about it for me that I could guarantee based on right this second. Um, obviously, three weeks ago, Ian Hamilton's on the roster, no brainer. Now he's going through a little bit of something. We need to see if he can bounce back from that. Luke Weaver looks fantastic. Um, I know he had kind of a you know a rough outing, but it wasn't even that bad. Tonkin is command related. Tonkin and Marinaccia, though, feel like, you know, kind of the unlikely guys to some people, but they feel like no brainers to me. Um, what Tonkin's doing is sustainable. Uh, it, you know, he's going up against all these different teams. Does not matter what batter is at the plate. He's generating soft contact or he's striking guys out and he's missing bats. So uh, it looks like the Mets blew another one there because Tonkin looks really good with the Yankees. And Marinaccio, since coming back, he looks totally fine. I know he gave up the home run. That happens, but I, I love his stuff. So I think at that point, you talk about those four guys, there's two spots left. We talk about the question mark guys, but then the 40-man roster guys, Yoendris Gomez, like I mentioned, he would really have to earn that, obviously. You have Cody Morris also on that uh, that list. You have the IL guys and Efros and Birdie and Brubaker. What does that look like? And then you have you know our guy Clayton Beater, and then Clayton Andrews, who I don't think anybody really wants to see after the last outing he had. So the reality is, Gary, I think they're going to be okay. Does that mean they they shouldn't make a, a move at the deadline? Absolutely not. We don't know who's going to be available at the deadline. I also forgot to mention Jay Cousins. The point I'm making is they're going to have... We made a whole standalone video of this man, <laughs> and he's just not even on the damn team. I know. <laughs> he owes it, us tickets it, or something. The, that was one of the best videos I think we put out, like as far as the uh, numbers. Viewership, it sure it made as hell no was. sense. It was like over no. a thousand views. Like what? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see about Brew Baker though. They gave up, a, like I mentioned, they gave up a really good prospect for Brew Baker. Um, you know, he's starting to ramp it up a little bit. We'll see. But this is tomorrow's little thing. We're just taking a sneak peek into tomorrow's problems. Let's talk about today's, I guess, a little bit, um, and not problems. Jose Trevino hitting very well. Another home run. We're starting to see the power there. He's got seven on the year. Um, love that. But you have Verdugo now, who's got his ninth home run. And this guy is driving in runs, Gary. He's over 40 RBIs on the year. He's batting 266. I mean, there is a legitimate question. Who will, He'll be 29 in, in May of next year, Gary. There's a legitimate question, and I think it's really going to start to come out if it hasn't already. Is Verdugo playing his way into a long-term role with the Yankees? And if so, what does that look like for the long-term of the New York Yankees? Because we know Judge is locked in. We know Soto's locked in, assuming they get a deal done. If they don't, Bronx is literally going to be burning like that show. Um, but, you know, all jokes aside... Uh, Verdugo, you know, we talk about Jason Dominguez all the time. Now they can create a spot for Dominguez by moving judge to first, by moving Soto to first, whatever they want to do. Okay. They can create a spot. Also, I want to point this out as well. Giancarlo Stanton is going to drop off at some point. Okay. We thought it was now we're happy. It's not, and it might not be this year might not be down the stretch. Hopefully it's not. But he is in the next couple of years. It's going to happen. He's old. He can only DH. So that DH spot is going to become available at some point. That's I, I also think that's something that's not talked about, Gary. So on top of the fact, DH is going to be available in the next two years. Uh, LeMahieu's gone. 
Rizzo's gone. Torres is likely all, all three of those guys are likely gone. There's going to be a lot of room created, not just money wise, but like room in the lineup. So Gary, Alex Verdugo, what do you think about him staying long-term? Because I also say this, what's playing into their hand, Spencer Jones does not look even close to ready right now. He doesn't look ready, but I'll say this. Mm -hmm. The Yankees are in a weird spot because everyone in hindsight is going to just, they can just wait around and then see what works out and say, well, that's what we should have done. Well, the problem with it is that when you do pay a guy like Verdugo, who I want to be a part of this organization, you're also saying no to the prospects. Okay, so it's not just do you want this player, it's do you want this player to block these prospects or do you care, does it matter if you block these prospects? Because again, if you put Verdugo in left field as a long-term option, okay, it's just money. I don't give a shit. If Hal Steinbrenner wants to spend the money and bring in Verdugo, we know he'll perform. We've seen it. And he's not old, okay? this He's like 28. So having said this, if you're going to put him in left field... You're telling me that one of Spencer Jones or Jason Dominguez would be traded. You answered via text because we talked about this prior to the show that it had to be Spencer Jones because Dominguez is a center fielder. Okay. And that piece in center field fits really well with what the Yankees are doing long term because it gets Aaron Judge off his feet and puts him at first base or DH long term. But here's the craziest part the whole, the craziest part about the whole thing is there's a huge narrative going out there that if Giancarlo kind of falls off and tails off the next year or two, that the Yankees wouldn't want to part from this $32 million a year contract, which is ironic, that number, because the Houston Astros just DFA'd early, earlier this morning, Jose Abreu, and they owed him $30 million. Okay, so if the Houston Astros can afford this, I promise you guys the Yankees can also afford to make the moves that best suit them, and they don't not have to be bound to money. Okay, I get it. You want Giancarlo Stanton to be on the field and play and play well at make because he's making thirty two million, and I want him to play well. But if you've got a really good prospect and there's a player who's already performing in New York extraordinarily well, don't deny that because of contract issues with some other asset who's going to be. I mean, this year he's 34 years old. So it's a tough call because I don't think it's the wrong move per se to let Verdugo go at the end of the year because the Yankees' aspirations are to win this year. But yeah. when we do this offseason and you're like, all right, what do we do with Verdugo? Well, if you spend the money on Verdugo, he's likely going to get a three- or four-year deal. That's my guess. He's played that well. So he's going to get a four-year contract and it kind of puts us in a position three or four years from now where we're looking at Verdugo kind of the way we do DJ LeMahieu this year. So I don't, I, I just feel like such a hypocrite, Jake, because you want to win now and you want to bring back guys in the short term to make sure in the short term we're as good as we possibly can get. But at the same time, you have to be responsible and we're still going to complain if a guy is making 15 million on the roster two years from now, and he's not performing. We're doing it right now with Anthony Rizzo, okay? The same thing. It's an identical thing. Rizzo was excellent for us. We re-signed him. He's in his mid-30s, and we're complaining about it now. So, yeah, I feel like I'll be happy regardless of what happens because at the very least, I know if Verdugo's not back, a top prospect is on the horizon. Yeah, I mean... To go back to what I said, you know, a, a few shows ago, I said I expect Verdugo to be back on a two-year deal with a player opt-out. That's what I said. Um, and I think it's going to be Glaber's money. I think the the thing, the dialogue change is, is he playing his way into, like you said, that four-year? Like where, you know, basically it's not, hey, we're going to talk you into being a Yankee. Like if you want to be a Yankee, we can only give you two years with the player opt-out. It's like the Yankees might even be enticed to give him four years. Um, the interesting thing is Spencer Jones is a center fielder right now, okay? Jason Dominguez is also a center fielder. Now, someone could say that the Yankees are just dumb and they're playing their two best prospects at the same position. Someone it also does could say stupid. it looks really <laughs> stupid. I'm not even going to hide it. 
Um, someone could also say it doesn't matter because if you can play center, you can play right and you can play left and they have the arm strength, both of them. So I think that's probably closer to the truth um, because you don't just from you, you played the outfield. I played the outfield playing in left field, playing right field center. As long as you know how to play center field, you're probably going to be fine in any of the others. Usually. Position. Yeah. So it's not that big of a deal. But another thing to think about, though, is what if this is more so, you know, presenting the opportunity where, hey, you know, it's kind of hiding in plain sight, but Jason Dominguez is our guy and we're trading Spencer Jones and he is available. And that's why they're playing the same position because we're not even going to like give him that opportunity. We, we don't even want to, to test ourselves. We're going to keep him in the same spot and make it easier for him to be traded away. Personally, I think they want a future with Spencer Jones, Jason Dominguez and Juan Soto with judge at first and then whoever at DH. But Verdugo can change plans. If he continues to hit like this, if he drives in, you know, 90 runs this year or a hundred runs, it's going to be hard to turn that guy away. Can the I ask one, you a question? Yes. What player in baseball history hit 270, drove in 100, was 28 years old, and got a two-year contract from a World Series contender? Have you ever heard of that player? No. Me either. So when Verdugo's agent gets into November, okay, because we're – he's – as soon as the winter starts, and yeah. we will cover the winter, not just Verdugo, every single player that you see – that's a free agent, an unrestricted free agent. We will talk about him. Okay. Well, he still has time to hire Scott Boris and get him that two year deal. He sure does. <laughs> Let's be clear, Jake. This player is not getting a two year contract unless he no. significantly declines his projections right now. He's going to drive in like 90. Why would that player agree to a two year contract? Is it best for the Yankees to give him two years and 30 million? Yeah, it would be way better. Any really good player that you want on your team, you know the most contractually fit deal that any team, they should never go beyond like three years. But the problem here, Jake, is that that's not the way business works. No. He's going to put, they're going to put money on his table and he's going to say what? No to the Seattle Mariners who offer him six years. Because it's not a huge risk to give Verdugo a six-year deal. It's not, depending on which organization does it. OK, it's not a huge risk for the Seattle Mariners who don't have a ton of talent in the outfield. But for us, it is a huge risk because you're talking about a team that we don't know what we're doing with Glaber Torres. Right. We don't know what we're doing with Clay Holmes. We don't we don't know what we're doing with Juan Soto. We haven't negotiated those terms. So when all these guys are on the books and then people are like, well, Seattle or or Boston or L.A. has offered him a six year contract. We're going to turn around and ask him to sign a one-year deal with a player option next year? I'm like, why the hell would he do that shit? Well, I'll tell you right now. You know who would 100% pay Verdugo? The Royals. Unless they want to see MJ Melendez, who is your favorite player of all time. MJ Melendez is absolutely <laughs> horrendous. I don't give a damn what anyone says. He is not good. I, no. <laughs> he's not good at all <laughs> no. <laughs> so th i had to bring it up so there you go right i mean i could absolutely see kansas city um you know i i think i think for dugo could be back i'm not willing to say he's 100 percent going to come back i think that the the two year with an opt out is realistic if he tails off a little bit he averages absolutely out about 250 you know, maybe knocks in 79, 80 runs, whatever. He's at 90, 100 runs, you know, for RBIs. And, you know, say he gets the home runs past 20 and he's hitting 270 something. Uh, yeah, it's going to be more towards that. Or, <laughs> he's too expensive for our blood now. Yeah, it is. Well, he shouldn't be, but you know how they, they roll. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see. Um, you know, hoping Scott Boris picks him up so he can get him a bad deal and, you know, he stays with the Yankees for cheap. Um, who knows? Boris is going to be out for blood. I mean, he shit his pants this past offseason <laughs> with, with Blake Snell and all that. And then, you know, now, because everyone's like, 
is Juan Soto going to sign early with the Yankees? I'm sitting there thinking, I don't think you guys understand. Scott Boris is is coming for blood. Oh, yeah. This guy Juan is, Soto should just can him. He should can him because it's, it's going to get so it. ugly. This offseason is going to be ugly. You think Aaron Judge, I mean, Aaron Judge was like a nose hair from being a San Francisco giant. Um, thankfully, John Heyman doesn't know what he's reporting. Otherwise, he'd be a giant. <laughs> but that's how close it was. It was it was marginal difference between the two teams, which is insane to think about now in hindsight. But with this whole Juan Soto thing, man, it's going to get ugly. And then, of course, when Verdugo, could you imagine? Yeah, if Verdugo signed with Boris, I mean, I would expect him to sign like an, a seven-year deal if he could. So, yeah. We want him to perform well, but it's like if he performs too well, then I'll take the he almost well. would be foolish. If he, yeah, if he performs too well, too yeah. well they're yeah. they're winning the World Series. So you're not wrong. I mean, that's now a four headed monster, five headed monster. If Stanton keeps it up, you know, at the top of the lineup. But yeah, that's going to do it. Uh, we appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Um, you know, we could talk baseball all day, so we always have to try to wrap it up. And sometimes we miss our cue, but is what it is. A little bit longer episode for you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, fun win and uh, we'll be back again uh, to touch on hopefully another win against the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park but I'm Jake Allen Bogan he is Gary Sheffield Jr. you can follow us on all social media at Jake A. Bogan at Gary Sheffield Jr. and at Yankees Unloaded until next time guys go Yankees and like this video <laughs>